It's about to go down with Mark and Kathy, a live coaching show about dropping ideas. Mark and Kathy coach and have conversations with brilliant idea creators who are reimagining the world through the expression of their words, thoughts, and action. Hey, everybody. Welcome to It's About to Go Down. I'm Kathy Armias. And I am Mark Williams, and we are here with the awesome, the phenomenal, the amazing, I haven't even said his name yet, and you Woo! know how crazy this conversation is going to be. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the one, the only, Cage Leitner. And Cage, Cage is the founder and the executive director of the Portland, yes, Kathy, we're giving you some Midwest, Midwest, Southwest, it's on the other side. West, of the West Coast. Let's go. West Coast, baby. <laughs> West Coast. <laughs> Listen, seriously speaking, the founder and executive director of the Portland Community Football Club and the founder of a consulting firm called Quant Quantum Gender. Uh, and, and, and Cage is going to be talking to us today about liberation, mm -hmm. personal liberation, sports liberation. So Cage... Are you ready to free our mind? Yeah. Uh, play Let's on that. Go. You love to play on that. I love it. I'm such a procedure. I'm I'm a, I'm, a t I'm tingling from head to toe already. <laughs> I can't. I just this is amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm so excited to be here with the two of you and Kathy for you and I to come back together after many many years since we first met and to find each other again is is so awesome. So. Thank you both um, for having me here. And I, I love the concept of this show. And so I'm just excited to be here and talk about big ideas. That is what I do. I talk about big ideas. I think about big ideas all the time. Sometimes they go places. Sometimes they just stay in my mind. Um, and this idea around liberation, personal liberation, liberation within sport particularly is really what I'm focused on right now. Um, I think it's it's good to start with a little bit about who I am for everybody who's listening so that this context of this conversation makes a little more sense. Um, I'm a queer person. I'm a transgender person. I was assigned the sex of female at birth. And so I was raised as a girl. I played sports as a girl. I was told a whole lot of things about what it means to be a girl in sports, um, too aggressive, too cocky, too assertive too much this and this and this and this, while also being told, oh, you're a pretty good athlete. So I had a lot of messages about who I should be, who I'm not supposed to be, um, and what that meant for me as an athlete. And at the same time, I found a lot of liberation for myself through sport. It was the place that I could work through my anxiety, I could work out trauma, I could work out the shame that I was feeling, deep inside of me as a person who was being told all the time, you don't fit here, you don't belong here because you don't look like a girl, you don't act like a girl. And sports was where I found my solace and it really saved me. It saved my life. And, and you'll hear from other trans people in sports, a similar method and similar mentality. And so that's really where the culmination, the spark of liberation in sports started for me and I didn't even know it. I didn't realize that as a kid, what was beginning for me was, was the understanding of where I now am in, as my adult life in trying to liberate other people within sport, liberate other people with for people of all gender identities, people who come up against racial barriers, people who come up against economic barriers in sport because what was happening to me as a young child was I was recognizing I don't belong here, but that's not right. And I don't want that to be the same way for other kids. And so fast forward through a whole lot of years and a whole lot of uh, change to my myself, growing hair on my face, my voice lowering, you know, all of these physical transitions. And now I run Portland Community Football Club and I've been running it for 10 years. And it is, thank you for the claps. Um, it is a club that is, it's a soccer club. So football in the global sense. And it is a soccer club that is dedicated to reducing and eliminating and healing the barriers around gender, race, and economics. 
when I started it, all I had in my mind as an idea was I want a soccer club for kids who are getting left out, who are feeling excluded and their parents can't find a way to get them involved because it's too expensive. It's too much to travel all around. It's too difficult to find a way in. It doesn't feel welcoming to people who are from, you know, other speaking other languages. There's so many reasons why there's this feeling of exclusion. And I saw that as a problem and a problem that could be fixed. Mm. And I thought I had a solution. And the solution that I came up with was don't have those barriers be a, play, a, a, a part of it. Make it low cost. Give kids uniforms for free. Don't travel all over the heck in place. Have your play right in, in the central area of where people live. Look at the barriers that exist. Think about it differently. Do it differently. That is what I did with PCFC. It was an, it made all the sense in the world to me that that could exist. And yet you are hard pressed to find another model like this, this around the country. Hmm. Um, so these 10 years of developing this soccer club, um, working through all of the barriers as an organization, trying to do things differently, finding the funding, getting the support we needed, all the coaches, everything. Basically, 10 years on, I've now realized that we are ready and poised to start a movement. We've been starting a small movement in Portland. We've been quietly underground, doing things differently, really making changes for, for people on an individual level, on that micro level in the social work world, as they say. I have a background in social work also. Mm. Now we're ready for the next level. We're ready for that, that mezzo, small circle micro, second circle mezzo, large circle macro. Mm. Okay, so mezzo level is where we're ready to go to now. That's kind of where we're sitting right now. And that means we're ready to blow this thing up in Portland. We want Portland to know about us. We want Portland to be behind us in a big, big way. And then that macro level, that's national. That's international. That's really getting the word out of here's a solution to a lot of these issues that are existing in sport. So how do you do that? How do you do that as a small grassroots, almost all volunteer run organization, you start a campaign. And so the Liberate Sports campaign is the thing to get us out into that next stratosphere. And so the Liberate Sports campaign is about gender, race, and economic barriers. and addressing those barriers, educating people about those barriers, understanding what it means to really solve for those issues, not put a Band-Aid on it, not kick it down the road, but to look at those issues and say, why do these exist? And the best analogy that I've come up with, it's a sports analogy, spoiler alert, the best analogy that I've come up with about how to really understand what this movement is about, soccer analogy, Think Ooh. about, <laughs> surprise, surprise, think about um, the Liberate Sports movement as the attacking team. We're headed down the field. The goal we're going towards is liberation. That's the goal we want to we want to reach. In our way as a defensive team, they are defending white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism. Mm. They are the ones that are defending and upholding the barriers and keeping us from getting to that goal. So how do we get to that goal? We find the spaces, we create the gaps, we get creative, we, we move in a way they didn't expect, we become unpredictable. These are the things that coaches teach kids and players on how to score a goal, how to break through those defensive lines. That's what Liberate Sports is honestly doing. We're looking at those barriers and those defenders and saying, how do we get to that side? And not how do we get to that side by leaving anyone behind, but how do we get to that side with the entire team and everybody pushing forward and everybody finding the, the space um, to create more space. So that's what we're working on. That's what I want to bring to the TED stage. That's what I want to I want to get people behind. And I want to use my story as a as a queer trans person who is very publicly out and by choice. Um, to really expand people's minds about these barriers and what does 
what does oppression really mean? What does it really mean to experience it? And what does it mean to feel liberated from oppression? I have felt liberated. I, I am liberated because I, well, it's complicated because I have white skin. I've always had that. That's always been part of my liberation. But now, because I have hair on my face for the last 16 years and a flat chest and a deep voice, I look and, and am perceived as a straight cisgender white man. Well, who gets the most privilege and the most doors open for them in our society? Those folks, right? That's just how this system works in our society. That's how white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy work. So I've got the opportunity to get into spaces, create those spaces. I've got the opportunity to get into those spaces with just an ease that I'll take, but I'm there to then blow it up. I'm then there to say, hey, everybody, I'm in here. Now let's have some real conversations that you probably are not used to people having with you. Let's really talk about the issues. Let's really talk about what's happening with these families that I know deeply and, and am connected to so strongly that I feel like they're my own families at PCFC and the, the things that they are dealing with and struggling with and up against. Let's have that conversation because I'm here on their behalf. And the thing that really fires me up about this is why is it that because I have hair on my face, I have a flat chest and a deeper voice, that's how I got access? That's the kind of society we live in? That's what we're saying is going to give people the key? No, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that being the reason why people get access. So I want to get use that access to change that immediately. Um, and immediately, I mean, you know, like in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know. I know. I was thinking the same thing, Mark. Oh, I have goosebumps cage. I already know. I already knew a lot of your story, although your story has continued to evolve and, and I'm really most excited. I have to say about hearing you wanting to blow it to the next level. And mm -hmm. the analogy that you use, Cage, I was like, oh, here we go. Sports analogy. And then I'm like, I like soccer. Let's go. But then when you said it, I was like, oh my God, it was so beautiful. It's not just mm -hmm. like, hey, the best defense is, you know, is a great offense. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was like it was yeah. like, you actually use the space analogy. And I love that. I love, love that. So Mark, we have a, we have a, we have, we have such a great um, idea to churn around today, but I definitely want to throw this out there of like cage needs to give a Ted talk for sure. I like, I have to say that out loud. I don't say that very often, right? Many times I'm talking to people and I'm like, how can we make your idea Ted worthy cage? You need to be on a Ted stage. You you're everything that you just said is so beautiful. So we need to spend the rest of this episode talking about that. Like, well, how do we need to position this? What are the things we need to lift up? What angle mm -hmm. do we take with the idea? If, if we were to put this in one sentence for, you know, a TED talk, what would it be? Like, I, we, we need to kind of be in that space. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, Cage, congratulations on everything. Like, Thank you know, you. it's so exciting that you're living not only your purpose and what you were meant to do in life, but I saw Mark, I looked at Mark because I was feeling those feelings when you said for other people that you love and care about. And I was like, oh. so yeah. thank you for that's being such a for. beautiful person. And yeah, Mark, that's what we, that's what we got. So mission, mission, mission uh, accepted. Nice. Most definitely, most definitely. <laughs> I, I'm all, and I'm all in. I, I just want to say for the, for the audience that's listening that I've been wanting to be on the TED stage for a long time. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I love public speaking. It is one of my happiest places, which I know is a rare <laughs> thing. Um, on most people, it's their worst nightmare. Um, but I love it. I love the energy. I love the ability to say these, these big ideas and get other people thinking big ideas. So yeah, I'm, I'm all in. Well, I got to tell you, uh, um, there's, there's so many things that are percolating in my head and I eventually, before we're done, I eventually want to hear a little bit more about 
how everything you said happens on the soccer field with those kids. Like I'm I'm just so curious about when 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 my little children come on to, you know, c- come come to be a part of, of your program, like mm-hmm. what are you doing that liberates them? Like, yeah. you know, I, I I'm a soccer novice, I must admit. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, Mark, we still love you. We love we love, we love, <laughs> that. We love all that. experiences of soccer. That we I do. I, that, I, right? I, I, I got to believe that I'm yeah. going to do a whole lot more than just kick a ball oh, yeah. in, in order for you to transform me. Um, yeah. But I wanted to ask this first. And Kathy, I'm curious what your thoughts on, since we're talking about the red circle. What are your thoughts around what Cage said towards the end about access, mm-hmm. hair, skin, flat chest? You said all of those things, right? Like, mm-hmm. take off my glasses and I can still see everything that gives you privilege. Mm-hmm. And you started talking to us about your idea from, shall I call it, the before, right? And then getting to the after. And to me, the after is, now look at all of this access I have and I'm not okay with that. And I wonder, Kathy, what might it sound like the reverse? We're starting off with the access. Like we look, your your audience looks at you and this is what they see and mm-hmm. all of the privilege that comes with it. And then it kind of, to me, I, I guess I thought about that because, and you did not use the word infiltrate. <laughs> yeah. But I have before. <laughs> but 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 you described it. <laughs> you, but you described it. Yeah. I, use, yeah. I use every other word but infiltrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh-huh. So I'm just I, curious. I, I like that, Mark. I because I mean, actually, when I met Cage, by the way, I would say that the what you're talking about was exactly how we met because we met, and I did not know this about Cage, and so it was revealed to me, and it was a beautiful mm-hmm. revelation. Mm-hmm. I remember I did not know that about you, Cage. Mm-hmm. I thought you were a white male. Yeah. That's what I thought. So yeah. assumptions. I like that because. You you immediately so you know picturing I, I we're getting into the semantics too of be, about being on the stage and and like where to go but I love that because it is about like first making people think a certain way like and mm-hmm. then you kind of show them that their thoughts had a little bit of they were tainted yeah <laughs> they were tainted yeah. with information that they believed and so I do like that a lot Mark um I I, I have a I have a thought, Mark, you're the questions person. So I don't want to step on your toes for, I'm like, I was thinking about it when you were talking, Mark, I was like, oh, Mark's about to drop a a question and it's going to lead the whole thing. We kind of have this like formula to how you and I work together, Mark, but I want to throw a question out there only because sports has also, I feel in ways when you were talking, I feel like it's liberated me in, in, in ways that you didn't describe But like, I always, I always personally um, would point to sports as saving me from um, being a drug addict or doing really bad Mm -hmm. things because I had a really bad life growing up. Mm -hmm. And so I felt it, I felt some of the things that you said. And so I, in my mind, I want to, I love the mission of it being access, you know, sports being not only a liberation space and access for people that don't normally get accepted. So I love that as like the main level, Mm -hmm. but one of the beautiful things that's a good undertone is sports has saved a lot of people's lives. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. It's a, it's a through line for many people of all kinds of lived experiences. Right. And so I wonder, I wonder too, like, I think I like, I love this. I, I could see how this campaign of like, uh, liberate sports. Uh, I feel like that's a good campaign, but for the idea, I'm wondering if we, I'm wondering what the next level of, uh, of that is. And what I mean by that is like, what I, and Mark, I think you were starting to get there. It's like, I like t- tell us a little bit more cage ab- about that, because what I want to get to, I want to find that one, that one line that really that would really sum up your idea would mm-hmm. like, it's not just what it, I feel like liberate sports is maybe like the outcome, right? Mm-hmm. So then there's, if it's a math problem, mm-hmm. Mark, I know you're an English teacher, not a math teacher, but if it was a math problem, uh-huh. it's like, what would the formula be that gets you to that outcome? And that, mm-hmm. that might be where that lies. So tell us a little bit, like, let's talk about that a little bit more. 
So you're looking for if if liberate if the the goal of liberation, going back to that analogy, is the outcome. What is the what is the work or the steps or the mechanics? What's the idea? Or the, or the and it's ideas, more, it's more the, the idea too. Not yeah. not necessarily because Mark started going down the route like I want to know what my kids are doing when I show up, and I yeah. don't think that's where the idea lies as much. I I feel like it's what's that idea that like cage tell me this okay i can ask you in this question you had okay. said you'd be hard pressed to find anybody else in the united states really doing what we're doing mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a minute okay. so so because i think the idea is going to lie in there like why is nobody else doing that and when other clubs because mm -hmm. i have been involved with other clubs before mm -hmm. i i coached as a soccer coach for a while i think you know that um mm -hmm. when they are providing you know, their kind of access, how is it different? What's the mm -hmm. big, like, let's talk about that for a minute. Like, sure. let's break down that as an idea. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good place to start. And I, and I do, I want to be fair that there are some other clubs around the country that are doing very similar things to us. Um, I just want to make a plug for South Bronx United in Bronx, <laughs> South Bronx. Let's um, go, they're let's amazing. Go Bronx. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're amazing. They're, they're a partner club of ours. They have shared resources. So I just want to say there is somebody else out there doing really, really cool stuff, but they're not quite exactly like us. And so what really sets us apart is that we are, and the reason why a lot of other people aren't doing it this way is that when I started this club, I started it with the, the core of it being from the communities themselves. It wasn't from, uh, you know, it, it didn't have any sort of like, um, we need to try to make money. We need to try to win trophies. We need to try to get to the biggest and best tournaments. I just came from the perspective of, well, here's an important part. I came from the perspective of that I'm an outsider. Mm -hmm. I was coming in as a white person, for and foremost, right? That's the first thing people are gonna see about me white person coming in as an outsider to communities of color. And that is one of the most important things for people to understand who want to do this kind of work that want to create something that's that's truly about um, radical inclusion, I like to say, absolute and radical inclusion, is that you have to recognize where am I an outsider? I might be an outsider because of the color of my skin, my gender presentation, my sexual orientation, my economic level. But by, by starting there at that place, that means that as an outsider, you recognize I, I will not be trusted at first. And that's okay. There will be a lack of trust. There will be questions of who are you? Why are you here? What are you doing in our community? you know, why should we trust you? That's okay. I expected those. I was okay with those. And so when you come in with that mindset first, then it, it, it's hard to describe, but it like dissolves the barriers, right? It, it presents, at least in my experience, it presents an approach to people who may be suspicious of you that are now going to say, oh, well, this person seems to be really genuinely interested in being a part of this community, not coming in and creating solutions or thinking that they have solutions to the issues that are a part of our community. Mm -hmm. It's being, it's recognizing you're an outsider and it's being curious and then having empathy. Those are the three things that are really important in getting to that next phase that we're talking about of creating a, something like PCFC and, and finding the space of liberation. Um, and that takes work. That takes personal reflective work. And I got to do a lot of that personal reflective work through my own transition, through my own experience of seeing people come in as outsiders in the, you know, who are straight and who want to be allies to us in the LGBTQ community, and just not really recognizing that, hey, you're a little misplaced here, or you're, you're trying to come in and, and take up too much space. I understood what it felt like for outsiders to come in and not recognize that they're outsiders. And so I was very aware of that. And then I also had some experience within the social work field. And so I had some of that structural knowledge around 
systemic racism, oppression, poverty, right? So I had all of those sort of, sort of mechanics. And that's, I, I think that that's not required to do this kind of work, but it's certainly helpful in creating a foundation and a baseline where you can build trust and build relationships with people from lots of different kinds of communities and, and build those bridges um, to then uh, find solutions together and collaborate and be co-conspirators together. That's the that's the that's the 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 turning point, I believe, in this kind of work. Mark, what is on your mind? You you have to take yourself off mute before you say anything though. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, that. I got you. <laughs> um first of all, I wrote down the phrase radical in inclusion. That 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 really resonated. I don't know if that's a term that somebody else has used, but it's the first time I've heard it. Um, here's what I was wondering, the question that's burning on my mind. I understand that people who feel like outsiders can find a place of inclusion, right? I'm, I'm wondering about the people on the outside. Or maybe, to use your metaphor earlier, the people on the defense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how much of this is about getting those people who are on the defense of racism and all the isms, mm -hmm. how much of this is about them um, not playing defense? Um, if I ruled the world, um, I would want to sit down with every single person who is on that defensive team and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and understand their perspective. That is my true life's work. And what I really want to do is really understand somebody's perspective who is completely opposite from mine. Who, who really believes in things that are completely different from me that I, you know, see as potentially damaging, um, racist, you know, homophobic, those things. I want to know why you think that, because they, help, they hold their defensive line just as strongly as I hold my offensive line. And so we have our opposing belief systems just as strongly. I want to know, I know why I hold mine. I know where mine comes from. Where does that person come from? And so that's the ideal in my world, Mark, is like, I don't, I'm not angry at them. I, I'm sometimes like really perplexed by people who have such hateful views, but I'm not angry at them. I'm curious. I'm mm. curious about their experience as a human being. What has led you to be in this place to think that me as a trans person is not worthy of being alive? or is, you know, trying to do something terrible to children? Like what, what has led them to believe those things? I want to know. And so that, that's, a, that's a big lift, right? To do that kind of work. And so I, to your question, to me, the baseline, the foundation of this work is being able to get this message so broad, so wide, and in such an accessible way and in a way that even somebody who thinks they know everything about the trans community or they think they know everything about, you know, the community that they're all against, they hear from me and they go, oh, I kind of want to talk to that person. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. That's what I love. That's I love connecting with humans. And I believe deeply in the healing power of connecting with people. So I believe so deeply and it makes me a little choked up because mm -hmm. there's so much energy in this universe, literal physical energy in this universe that is bouncing around that we can find ways to harness it and use it and connect with individuals. And we are doing something in Portland that is revolutionary and it needs to be known not because it's just because of soccer it needs to be known because we are actually unraveling the systems that are causing oppression we're not solving it i'm not solving systematic oppression and racism 
within the soccer club, but I am actively working with people who are experiencing it to find the solutions to busting it open in some way. Um, I know that maybe to a lot of people sounds like that's really far fetched. Like, what are you talking about? You're you're not gonna, you know. And I'm like, this is how I, this is what I do. I think big, and I and I don't, I don't believe in backing down from from big challenges. Love it. I had a thought. Okay, when you were talking, Cage, thank you by the way. I think just everything that you just said helped at least from my mind, Mark. I don't know like what you were thinking, but as you were running through and talking about like you know, I forgot the third one, but it was like being, being an outsider, having the empath empathy, like you, you mentioned three things in there. Curiosity. Oh, the curiosity. Right. Right. Um, one of the things that came up for me is like, while you were saying that I was thinking that, you know, being an outsider creates the space to becoming an insider. And that's what, that's what the liberation is. Right. If, if, Cause it's exactly what you talked about. You're like being an outsider first, it creates this space. And I love that you talked about the non-trust um, cause trust is always earned. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad in the world somehow, if you really think about how we operate, just like in a, like a bigger outside sports is like, we, we just assume that we should have trust everywhere we go. And one mm -hmm. of the things I like about what you did and what you've created of like for the community within the community is like, mm -hmm. you went in and you were like, you were creating a space of trust out of the gate and not just saying, Hey, I'm coming in, I'm trying to do this grand, great thing. So you should just trust me. Yeah. Just trust me. Yeah. Why don't you think it's so great? <laughs> yeah. It's so great. Just trust yeah. me, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's something around that because I think Mark, so here, here, here's where I want to connect with our brains a little bit. Okay. I think that if people hear liberation through sports and I, I don't think that's a deep enough, it doesn't hit us on that emotional level yet. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to that deeper idea that is like, again, I, 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 what in my mind, I'm like, that's the outcome. You're like, wow, you make the world a better place. There's some liberation through sports mm -hmm. and it started from the personal space, but what, what can we get at that? Like we're, we're starting to scratch that surface. And one of the things that I'm really clinging on to is this being an outsider and Cage, you even said something that really made me think. You asked, like, where am I an outsider? Mm -hmm. where, how do I show up as an outsider? Mm -hmm. and, and I mm -hmm. I actually thought that was a great question, Mark, because that is where you can find people feel they're safest where they're not an outsider. Mm -hmm. But where do people grow the most and connect the mm -hmm. most is where they might be an, an, an outsider on something. Mm -hmm. Like in this group, you're an outsider for not being a soccer player. I mean, I'm just going to put it out there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> also, yeah. you're an East Coaster. So I yeah, mean, you right. know, like, yeah. right. <laughs> um, you know, but, but yeah. <laughs> but I like that. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think about that, Mark? <laughs> um, what came up for me when you were, when you were speaking was, Ironically, how inclusive the question, where am I or how am I an outsider? Mm -hmm. Because when I think about everything that you've talked about, Cage, you know, sometimes it's defense versus offense. Am I on the offense? Am I on the defense? Who are you to tell me I'm being oppressive? Mm -hmm. Who are you telling me I need to be... But where or how am I an outsider? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would argue that everyone on some level mm -hmm. in some way yep. is an outsider. Yep. You know, Kathy already called me out. Because yep. yeah. I don't play soccer. I have, you know, I've kicked a ball or two. <laughs> have you? That's all it takes. Kick the ball around, you're, you're a player. That's it. Let's go, um, Mark. Yeah, but yeah, I like I the idea you. of that question mm -hmm. um, because it's inclusive. And because I guess the reason why I asked that question earlier about the, the people on the, on the defense is sometimes when we bring up these topics, we almost divide the room. Yeah. And then it's like, who am I talking to? Am I talking to the outsiders or am I talking to the people who are keeping you out? Mm -hmm. But in this case, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to speak to everybody so that if we all can accept 
on some level in some way that we all have this outside I don't know what do we want to call it right but 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 this outsidedness of us mm -hmm. um, when we can relate on that common level now we can probably start talking I love that Mark because it's like be attracted to the out be attracted to being the outsider because if you are you will be curious cage it's like hitting mm -hmm. all your points right mm -hmm. if you're attracted to that like mark for instance i mean you might have kicked a soccer ball but if somebody told you send a through ball do you know what that means and cage and i know exactly what that means right mm -hmm. it's right. a pass where somebody's yeah. running and you send the ball through right and so Very common I, you, sense mark yeah <laughs> i'm like kick it through yeah. what kick it, yeah through what? through what no but i love that because you made me think about the fact that there's always an ecosystem to something and yeah. i remember i mean i became a soccer player because i married a spaniard that was like when i first started playing soccer i was like i don't know and i know all and i know how to say all the things in both english and spanish now mm -hmm. so like but mm -hmm. complete outsider on that when i first started playing right and so uh, like, and I started playing as an adult. I mean, Cage, you grew up playing, but I started playing at 30, which yeah. is really oh. late for yeah. starting a sport and to play that competitively. So I think you're right, Mark, that there is, there's some, there's something that everybody could be attracted to of if you can get people the, so the formula, and that's what I was getting to before the formula is getting people to want to be attracted to things that they're an outsider on. And mm -hmm. what will the outcome of that be? Mm -hmm. Liberation through sports. And that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what I was getting at before mm -hmm. is that's the formula and then that's the outcome. But I, I agree, Mark, you really hit it on the head. Uh, Cage, if you just were to go tell a bunch of people, hey, you're playing defense right now. Like you need it in order for us to have liberation, you need to do this. They might, they might push mm -hmm. back and be like, Mm -mm. I'm actually on offense. You're on defense or, right. you know, they might think the opposite. And so I don't know. I just really like that cage. What do you think about it? Yeah, I, I love it. I think, um, I'm always looking for the, um, the through ball. I'm always looking for the through line <laughs> of, of connectivity between humans, um, because we have them, like I just said. And so the, what I think we're kind of circling around here is that there's an, a shared experience of being an outsider in some way, but it requires some folks who maybe have, who hold higher social privilege to really have to um, stop and think about it a little bit more versus those of us who are like, oh, yeah, I see it. I know how I'm an outsider in this society, right? I can, you can draw on that experience pretty quickly, but those who have experienced more of the privilege it's not to say that they haven't been an outsider in some way, but it's maybe harder for them to see. And so it takes more um, time and patience to help those folks see that. And that's, that's the kind of work that I love to do. I love to get into those conversations, like I said, and really get to know people and find out how do they move? How do they tick? What do they think? And, and where is that like, Oh, that's that's where your outsiderness is is happening. That's where you can can empathize in some way with somebody else who you think you have nothing in common with. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very siloed in our society. We're incredibly divided. We're in Portland. We live in a very divided city. We have very sub subsets of of neighborhoods. And um, I feel incredibly fortunate that in this work, I get to be a part of all of these different communities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing in real time what it means to connect with people who I don't speak the same language as them. I don't have the same color of skin as them. Um, I, you know, we don't share any sort of um, gender identity or sexual orientation common, commonality. We don't have any of these things in common, but what we have in common is we love this game. We love to laugh. We love to tell silly stories that if we don't understand the language that we're speaking and we love to see kids happy and we love to mm -hmm. see kids thrive. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all I needed to be able to connect with a lot of people who seemingly I'm very, very different from. And, mm -hmm. and the flip side of that is I've been nothing but accepted as an out queer trans person from all kinds of communities mm. who we often have pre, -mis pre misconceptions of 
oh, they're not going to accept you, right? There's religious barriers. There's there's cultural barriers that are going to say, absolutely not. We can't accept you. I've gotten none of that. I've gotten everything the opposite of that because they saw the commonality of, oh, you've experienced oppression. You've experienced being an outsider. We've also experienced that. We're, we're, we're here with you. We, yeah. we, we understand. So yeah, that's the, that's why that hook is so good. Yeah. Cause it's all, yeah. it's kind of like, where do you live outside of the lines? It's like, I felt like mm-hmm. if you were giving a talk, let's, let's just not say it's a Ted talk for the moment. Like, let's say you were talking to a group of people and you just, you're, you know, in order to make a connection with a general audience, I think I could see you asking people where, where do they live outside of the lines? Where, where, mm-hmm. where are even in their accepted spaces with the people that are accepting mm-hmm. of them? What is that one thing about yourself that you would be like, Oh, I'm, I, I that might be a little bit outside of these lines for this mm-hmm. group of people. Um, I think you get everybody on board, like Mark said. Yeah. And that to me, that's also following what you brought up at the beginning, Mark, too, is even this format of talking about the outsideness first. I love that you you coined that or you just said it before you said Out, it. outsiderness. Outsiderness. Yeah. I like it. I yeah. wrote it down. I was like, outsiderness. Yeah. Yeah. If you talk about the outsiderness first, I think you get to the liberation mm-hmm. next, right? Mm-hmm. It's not the other way around. Sometimes I think what happens, especially in a space where people are trying to go for a goal, they try to just go to the goal straight. Mm. And I don't think that like, I mean, let's go back to the soccer analogy. It doesn't work. Nobody's going to let you run all the way down the field with the ball and not stop you. And that's in everything. And no. I know, right? Not really. That's how soccer. And that's like, that's a life analogy though, too, if you think about it. You could yeah. start a business. Nobody's just going to, there's not going to be just an open space because you opened your doors and all of a sudden you're like, nope. you're going to go straight to, to success. You got to yeah. zig, you got to zag, you got to go up, you got to go back. Yeah. You got to pass, you got to move, you got to create yeah. space, you got to. Mm-hmm. So I, the more I think about it, I think that we should be tying that and now get, you got to get, you got to hook people first with the fact that we all share that that we Mm -hmm. all share ourselves as an outsider Mm -hmm. because then the, then once you've laid that groundwork, I feel like I could see you doing this in the Ted talk. We were like, okay, we can all agree that we come from some outside. What, where does that outside lie? Um, Mm -hmm. But the only way that we're going to connect all these outsided bubbles is through liberation. It's personal liberation. It's Mm -hmm. liberation through sports. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sports is a great, in some ways, in some ways it's not, it's a great equalizer. In some ways it's very much yeah. not. And I know yeah, that, right. I, I know, I know, you know, you know what I'm talking about on both sides, right? Because mm-hmm. in some ways it connects a lot of people together. In other ways, it, there, there's sports that you can't even, you, there's the entry fee is too grand for, for yeah. people. Yeah, there's you know. still lots of restrictions within sport. And there's lots of the, the gender binary exists so strongly within sport. And so that's part yeah. of the, that's part of the liberation movement is, um, and, and and actually, when we go back to that conversation about um, asking people, how are you an outsider? I actually do this in my consulting work. When I do mm. workshops with folks, I do a, a one minute exercise where I, I, before the one minute exercise starts, I explain the gender binary system and just break it down for everybody. It's pretty simple. Our society operates as if there's only male and female options accept, acceptable. Here's all the rules that go with them that are all, you know, supposed rules. And then my one minute exercise for everybody is I want you to write about all the ways that you don't fit in to this gender binary system. Mm -hmm. What are all the ways that you don't fit? They may not even be ways that you express outwardly. It may be thoughts you have. It may be, you know, just things you, you wouldn't even say out loud. And I give everyone a minute and then we come back. A lot of times this is virtual and we come back and I ask for people to share. And a lot of times it's people who are heterosexual and cisgender people who are like, I like to wear this kind of clothing. And I feel like that doesn't allow me to fit into my work environment. Or, you know, there's a million different reasons that people suddenly start to see, oh, yeah, I don't fit into that. that. That's not right. Um, and I think that's, that's where we're getting at, Kathy. 
like that exercise is actually, I'd yeah. actually love to do that exercise with an audience full of people. Um, yeah. I know the TED stage isn't exactly the <laughs> interactive yeah, not, stage. Yeah, it's not a super interactive. But, but Mark, but are you can. saying, was your thought, was your <laughs> idea there of like, why not? Well, well, one, why not? Um, and, and you know, I haven't seen the trillions of TED Talks like Kathy has, right? But I, I do recall a couple of TED Talks that I've seen where people have done a couple of interactive things. I, as a matter of fact, I remember seeing one where everybody was asked to draw something. Um, so I, I definitely think okay. there's a place for some interactivity to it. It's not done often, but when done well, I'm sure it could be absolutely fabulous. And I love, I love this one minute exercise. Oh, I do too. Very revealing, very okay. revealing. And the, and the reason why I just thought of it is because Kathy, when you were saying the hook is about this, this outsiderness, I feel like the way to really get people hooked in on something like this is for them to do something, right? To yeah. either, either for me to tell a story or for them to do something. And so, you know, I, I do actually have a pretty powerful story that I haven't told publicly yet that I've been thinking about in a keynote format. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if that would fit into the TED Talk um, format too, but that's the way to hook people in, right? Is to get, that's part of education. That's, that's what I am, honestly am. I'm, an, I'm a coach and I'm an educator. And the way you get people to really think about a different concept is to make it interesting and 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 get their brains really wanting to work around it. And most people like to think about themselves. It's not, no shade. I, I was going to say, I would take it even a step further and say, you have to make it their own, but you're yeah. right. I mean, yeah. uh, and so that, and that's, I think that's where we're all getting at right now is like your one minute exercise that you have people do. I can listen to your story cage and then go, Oh, wow. That's a powerful story. Right. But you might not make right. me think because I don't have your exact same situation exactly. you might make me think oh that, wow that, I could totally see why you're doing that's amazing but then maybe not connect myself to what you right. to your same mission but as you talk about it I think Mark and I would totally agree we're right there with you we yep. could tell you a hundred ways why we don't belong where mm -hmm. we don't belong or where we're an outsider or where you know what I mean mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that makes us all that and that puts all three of us in a space where we're connected Right. And we can have, if we, if we were to do that exercise together, we could all share stories and now yeah. we're sharing stories about each other and, and learning about one another. And that's how you build connection community. And you, and you actually have that radical inclusion. And then uh, that's where you hit them with the, that's where you infiltrate and say, and <laughs> also I want to do this through sports because I believe it's such a beautiful place to do it. And it builds such mm -hmm amazing bonds and confidence in people. I, like, I really, I it really do. It's almost like you've, you've withered away the, the, the defense and then you're like, Fwah. yeah, yeah. They've just fallen down. You're like, and then hey. you're running straight to goal, right? Like, you're like, yeah, exactly. I don't they're know. like, wait, I thought it was a timeout. We're still playing. <laughs> no, we're so there's no timeouts in no soccer. Timeouts. <laughs> no timeouts. No timeouts in soccer. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I got to tell you also, since you mentioned being a teacher in education, what's interesting to me also about the, the one minute exercise you do is I have often found as an educator that when we sometimes ask a question like, you know, what makes you an outsider or how are you an outsider? There are so many different things going on mm -hmm. that it's hard for some people to kind of like mm -hmm. really pinpoint. Mm -hmm. And what I like about that question is, is, is there some, you know, the way you set it up yeah. it creates such parameters for it yeah. that it gives people a direct way of trying to answer it. Um, so I that that's another reason why I like that. And I think that's what makes it um, an activity that you can do even on a TED stage because it doesn't take a lot of time to set up mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily give a lot of take a lot of time for people to answer and it doesn't have to be a dialogue right in a training you could then open up the dialogue and have people go into breakout rooms sure all you got to do here is get people to think yep yep to really connect with the concept um through an activity yeah 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 i like it i mean quite honestly one of the things that has maybe not stopped me from doing a TED talk, but has always been a little bit of a hesitant is I really like interactive things when mm -hmm. I'm speaking. 
Yeah. It feels very authentic to me to interact with the people that I'm talking to. And so in my mind, I've been like, I just hadn't seen that happen on the TED stage. It's very much like speaking to. And so, yeah, if you if you all think that it's got some legs behind it, um, I would love to to flesh that out. And and I'm starting I'm thinking through also the, the keynote speech that I've been starting to work on with. Um, I've got a communications consultant on our team this year who's brilliant and is helping me to kind of synthesize a lot of this. Um, and so I think taking what we're talking about here, taking that work and and trying to put it together into something that is TED Talk worthy, I think is real close. Yeah, I, I just want to say for the for the record too, Mark, because I you probably heard about this through me, but I, I coached my friend Gary Hirsch. He was giving this second TED Talk. And Cage, you probably know who Gary is, very famous in Portland. He does a bunch of murals. Um, yeah. in Portland and whatnot. Yeah. So he was giving a TED talk and he's an improv artist, but he's also an artist artist and he just does murals and stuff. And so he wanted to bring the two of those things together in his last TED talk that he did. And so we had, you know, we talked through his idea of having two people uh, on a stage. So he was one of them and he brought, he actually brought somebody on the stage with him and he said, Hey, we're going to start drawing like a person together. And then we're going to name it together. We're going to go. So they, they started wow. drawing different features. And so they would all draw one thing and then the other person would draw, and then they created this. And then they, they wrote one letter at a time and gave it a name, you know, gave this person a name or whatever. Yeah. And so it was a brilliant, really fast, like maybe minute and a half thing mm -hmm. that was done that showed a really big impact on collaborative, you know, he was talking mm -hmm. about collaboration and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So definitely, I love where we're going as far as like the TED Talk. I love two things about it. We're starting to get to the formula. And so it still doesn't mean that the idea is not liberation through sports or personal liberation. That doesn't mean the idea has changed. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the way that you present it is is chain is, is changing. Like, and, yeah. and it sounds like you've already done it that way, Cage. So it it really, I mean, it really seems appropriate to me. I I I would ask us to play a pre, uh, quick game right now. Mark, I haven't done it in a while. I know it's Kathy and game time. Sometimes in the middle of our shows, I'm like, let's play a game. I love it. And Cage, you love games, so I let's love play, games. Let's play a game. Yeah. Let's play a game. Let's. If, if from the conversation that we've had already today, if you were to name this TED Talk, what would you title it? <laughs> well, this is a hard game. It is a hard game. <laughs> it's a very hard game. Um, but I think it also will inch us into the right direction. And there's really no wrong answers, right? No mm -hmm. matter what any of us say, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get our brains in the space where we're like, okay, Cage, you want to give a TED talk. This is very TED worthy. The mm -hmm. world does need to hear about it. It is very important. I, I think a lot of people would just tell you, just get on the TED stage. And I think that's a mistake. Yeah. yeah. I think it's critical mm -hmm. how you position this. It's so mm -hmm. critical. And so I think it's worth exploring how would you present this idea? Because I think a lot of people think, oh, just get on the stage. And when you're on the stage, you can, you know, tell this idea. But I, I, I don't, how do you get even, how do you even get people to tune into your station if you don't, yeah, if you don't yeah. pull them and, in first? Right. And to get people curious, that's, that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about in, in, a, in a title. Is there, to help me sort of think that, is there um, a, a kind of preferred formula of a title for TED Talks? Like, only like like words. how like asking a question or something yeah asking like a question making it a statement it or does it is it not matter and it's just I about I, I don't think there's any like standard conventions but things I personally like are ones where I'm like I I hear the title and I go oh I have to know more yeah what is that yeah, yeah. what is that mm -hmm. like I don't want to hear a thousand ways to make a million dollars or like, right. I don't want to hear, you know, and that's not a typical Ted, you know, in all well, fairness, that's not a typical Ted talk. Title. And that's why the first thing that came to my mind was something around like using the word belonging. But then I thought, eh, that's a catchphrase that gets thrown around a lot. Yeah. Right? People it's use not, it a lot. it's not like, but that's really what we're talking about. Yeah. Talking, I mean, out, outsiderness and, and then, you know, moving from the outsiderness position into feeling as you are part of an insider's group and you are part of that community now, you are finding belonging. Yeah. Um, but belongings, it's not going to catch people in the same way. And so there's something around a title that's around 
using the word liberate, using the word outsider, using those concepts and somehow bringing that together in a way that's interesting to people that they're curious, what does this mean to be a, I almost said liberated outsider. That's not really what it is. It's, yeah. it's, uh, what is, what is it? I do like the idea of it being a question. Mm-hmm. Um, we asked, you know, the question I asked that you both kind of glommed onto was like, where, where am I, how am I an outsider? Where do yeah. I find myself being an outsider? Um, how can being an out, how can being an outsider uh, bring liberation? Something like that, right? Something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a, this is a tough game. Yeah, I know. To the Kathy, leave it to Kathy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tough game. I, yeah, I go like, ahead. oh no, I was just going to say, I, I like, I think the outsiderness is something that I, I think would need to be in it, at least from the conversation we're having today. Mm-hmm. And I do feel like it's something like that. And I do like, I do like Cage to it being a question because I don't think this is something that if somebody heard that question, I don't think that they would have an answer for it. And that, so then that begs curiosity. Mm-hmm. I don't think somebody can just answer it immediately. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's what would make you curious. If you ask me a question that I know the answer to, I don't need to watch your talk. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? What about the question of what does it mean to be an outsider? It could be as simple as that. I, I really like that. Because the, the, fr- the term outsider is, how, I mean, how often do you use that word? I don't use that word very often. Not, not right? very often. That's no, what is not brilliant like about a, it. Yeah. Right. It's not used very often. It's not something that people, I think, think about, but it's got all the synonyms to it of exclusion, um, you know, f- feeling othered, feeling yeah. left out. Th- those are all the same concepts, but we don't often just say outsider. Um, yeah. And so I think, yeah, what does it mean to be an outsider is a potential. Yeah. It's a working title. All right. Quick, quick trivial thing. <laughs> I didn't play soccer, but I grew up watching a lot of professional wrestling, right? That's what makes me an outsider. Yeah. Um, several yep. years ago, there was a storyline about two wrestlers who were working with one company and came to another company okay. to infiltrate, ultimately to infiltrate. And what were their names? The Outsiders. Mm. Oh. And then it actually ended up becoming one of the most popular storylines in all of professional wrestling. So it's interesting. interesting. Um, okay. It can become a very popular phrase, um, okay. but I like, I like what does it mean to be an outsider? Mm-hmm. Or what makes you an outsider? What, that was the other oh, one I was going Yeah, I like that one. Outsider? I mm-hmm. like that one, Mark, because then mm-hmm. that, that answer, that also, that makes it about me as the listener. Mm-hmm. Right. Like mm-hmm. really about me. If I saw a giant billboard in Portland that said TEDx, whatever, 2024. Yeah. What makes you an outsider? Right, that's That's, what you just said, Mark. What makes you an outsider? Mm -hmm. I would be like, I'd be driving along. Yeah. (laughs) What's that? What does that mean? What does that Um, mean? Yeah. yeah. When I, cause you know, I've got all my ideas of what, of what outsider means and everybody's going to have their ideas. So, all right. Love it. I this, love it. And and maybe this is a good great. place to ask, like, maybe this is a good place to wrap it up and see like the conversation that we've had today cage makes me think that if I was coaching you right now to give a Ted talk, I'd be like, "Woo, we got a lot of work to do for sure. But also at the same time, there's such a the idea is so good that it, it it's deserving of that work. In mm-hmm. The same way that when you're working with a soccer team, you don't mm-hmm. just get a great offense or great defense just by saying you should do these things. You have to work through them and find a system. And yes. so I, I would encourage you to like percolate on what we talked about here today, but there's so mm-hmm. much more. I think it can go a lot deeper than what we talked about. But, but in this little amount of time that we've had a conversation, um, what, what have you thought about the idea? Tell us, tell us how your views of thought uh, on this have changed. I mean, it's, it's been an incredible evolution. I feel like I've just like gone around the planet a few more times than usual in a 24 hour day. Um, 
And I think what's interesting is that I came into this conversation, as I mentioned a couple of times here, already having some structure around a keynote, right? And starting to put some really powerful thoughts together. And now I'm really excited to go back to that and infuse some of these ideas or bring some of that into this. Like it's, I've got these two sort of um, big thought buckets that are kind of happening all at the same time. And I'm just so excited. I just love this stuff so much. I, I got a bachelor's in philosophy mm. because I loved thinking yep. about really, really hard things that I, and I still do. I am teaching myself physics because I'm just like, I don't get it. It's really That's hard. Really quantum, <laughs> quantum physics. I'm really excited about quantum physics specifically. Mark's like, it's, so hard <laughs> because it makes my brain just melt like so fry, right i i love it this is what i love to do so i really i just am so appreciative to both of you of having such a great platform for for big thinkers to come and do this kind of work thank you cage well cage your 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 idea that's just getting ready to like really blow up in portland and then go to the macro level tell us how people can find out about what you're doing and like where should they find you on socials sure. because we need to get this out there even before you do your TED talk. <laughs> um, so Portland Community Football Club is a great one to follow on socials because it's far more active than me personally. Um, PCFC Soccer is our handle for Instagram and Twitter. Um, we're mostly active on Instagram. Um, I am at Kate, Coach Cage um, on uh, Instagram. I've been sort of active on social media. You know, I got a lot going on. I'm a new dad also. I've got a six month old, um, you know, so you're, you're not going to see a whole lot of activity, but you can find me there and see things that I've posted. Um, and then uh, Portland Community Football Club is just Google us. You'll find us easily. Um, and then we've got a big event coming up. So you follow us on social media and you can see that big event and we'll be talking about Liberate Sports there and collaborating with the sports bra and it's going to be good stuff. Uh, yeah, awesome new bar, new bar in Portland. So uh, check them out as well. Cage, yeah. thank you. Um, I I so appreciate you coming on, having this conversation. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Anybody listening, especially if you're a TED organizer, you need to talk to Cage mm -hmm. because he needs that stage. And Cage, yeah. just keep doing what you're doing, my friend. This thank is you. awesome. Thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing the big ideas. If anybody out there is watching and you have a big idea and you want to chat with Mark and I, you know where to find us. It's about to go down show.com. Hit us up. We want to talk ideas. We want to, we want to talk philosophy on ideas. We love that too, Cage. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being part of our show today. And you know, every time I feel like it goes down. And so until next time and every time it does go down on, it's about to go down with Mark and Kathy.